the Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Uh, There is nothing that we can do without you. Uh, You are our shield against the hateful darts of the enemy. And Lord, I think of of your church right now gathered in this place. And uh, the enemy would love to hurl his darts even in this moment. He would love for your people to be unable to hear your word because of distractions maybe because of of guilt and shame that they're bearing on their own shoulders rather than casting on Christ. Uh, Maybe uh, relational struggles and arguments and little seeds that have been sown in their hearts before they gathered. Uh, But you are our shield, and we lift up that shield high today. And I pray, Lord, that you'd guard our ears and our minds and our hearts. I pray that you would miraculously open our ears and our minds and our hearts and direct my tongue. And Lord, I pray that we would see from your word today what it is that we were meant to see. Lord, this is your day. We rejoice. We're glad in it. And we expect to hear from you. Your word goes forth and it never returns void. That is your promise. And so, Lord, we come today holding on to that promise. And we declare with you that the the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And so, Lord, we expect great things. And we come to you now in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I look out and I see that we have a a number of of pastors visiting with us today. Uh, And on a day when I just received the preaching award, I just want to have a disclaimer. There weren't a ton of preachers in the class, so don't don't come in with those high bars. I'm just going to try to be faithful. But um, you might have heard this week that Elon Musk made headlines when he spent $44 billion to purchase Twitter. And if you know any dads, you've probably heard the dad joke a few times now that, uh, that those dads actually downloaded it for free at the App Store, so they're not sure what Elon was doing. I heard that from two dads this week. You know who you are. Um, we all have those dads in our lives. The social media market is thriving in our day and age, with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and all of the ones that I've never heard of. We communicate more than ever before. However, while the quantity of our communication has never been higher, arguably the quality of our communication has never been lower. In fact, many of us have rendered ourselves incapable of having meaningful conversations because meaningful conversations require more than 280 characters. And they require other things like eye contact and respect and thoughtful listening, and and other relics of days gone by. And as I say that, I'm not not suggesting that this is a a kids these days thing, uh, or or the world out there thing. This is something that we all have to wrestle through. Uh, Two weeks ago, I was at a conference uh, for pastors called Together for the Gospel, where 10,000 pastors were gathered, and we sat under the preaching of the Word, and, and it was excellent. And in one of the panel discussions, John Piper, who had preached earlier that day, he made a, a sharp remark, and he, just, he noted that as he looked out over this room full of pastors, and as he preached the word, a large number of those pastors were locked on their phones, scrolling through their Twitter. And so this isn't just an outside thing, and this isn't just a young thing, this is a reality of the world that we live in. We're distracted. I say all that to make this point. There's never been a generation more connected than ours And simultaneously, there's never been a generation more disconnected either. We talk at people all day long, but we're forgetting how to talk to one another. We relate with everyone, but we foster deep, meaningful relationships with no one. And that's a problem, because relationships matter. And in our text this morning, Paul is laying out some principles for young Timothy in terms of how he can foster those relationships within the church family in Ephesus. This text that we're looking at is not disconnected from what we were studying last week. If you remember last week, our brother Matt walked us through 1 Timothy in the end of chapter 4, where Paul's explaining how Timothy's going to face some challenges because he's a young man. But if he sets the believer an example in his life, and if he sets the believers an example in, in his doctrine, if he preaches the word faithfully, everything's going to go well for Timothy. So this is now related to that, because Timothy's called to preach, but he's not preaching in a vacuum, he's preaching to people. Timothy's preaching to to men and women, young and old, and if Timothy doesn't give thought to the relationships in the church, 
then he can preach all day long, but nobody's going to listen to him. He's got to foster these relationships. How he says what he's called to say matters. And if he's not thoughtful and intentional about that, then nobody's going to bother listening to young Timothy. And if nobody's listening to young Timothy as he preaches the word, then there will be no change. And similarly, if you want to see change in your family, if you want to be used by the Lord to speak change into the lives of the people that you're mentoring, or if you want to be used by the Lord to minister in your workplace or on your street, then you too need to give thought to the relationships that are around you. So this word is for Timothy, but it certainly applies to every one of us here in the room. So would you look to God's word, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1-2, to two, and hear now his holy, inspired, inerrant, living and active word to us today. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters in all purity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, we're dealing with two verses today, and the instructions in this passage are relatively straightforward. We're going we're gonna to work through those. But, in fact, there's an underlying, underlying assumption in this passage that requires a bit of thought for us. Notice the language that Paul uses in this text. It's family language. He's talking about brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers in the church. And if we're not careful, we're going to listen to Paul as if he's just using an illustration to try and pull us in. You know, he's, he's exaggerating, using hyperbole. But that's not what Paul is doing. Paul understands that the church is a family. And he speaks to Timothy with the assumption that Timothy believes that. And he's writing here in this text, and as we read it, we need to understand, he's expecting that we believe that. That the church is a family. And so rather than just assuming that we all agree and that we all live our lives this way, I wanted to stop and just to reflect on that for a moment. That the church is a family. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, if you, if you flip back a page in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 3, you see Paul introduces this idea in the letter in verses 14 and 15. Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that, so this whole letter, he says, I'm writing this letter so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. So Paul, as he's painting the picture of what the church is, he tells Timothy, it is the household of God. And Paul's not, he's not developing this idea from scratch. He's flowing out of what, what was passed down through Jesus Christ. And so if you flip in your Bible back to Mark chapter 3, you can see this. In Mark chapter 3, verses 31 to 35, they come to Jesus, and his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him, and they called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus is teaching us in Mark chapter 3 that there is a family line that runs deeper than your blood. Do you believe that, Christian? Have you experienced that, Christian? And I know as I look out that the reality is that many of you do not or have not. Many of us continue to live our lives separated from the family of God. And there's multiple factors. You know, for some of you, you, you're doing that intentionally. You keep everybody at arm's length because that's the way you like your life. And your home is a palace where your family lives and you don't let people into that. And your thoughts and your struggles are your own thing to deal with. And you and your wife will deal with that. But nobody else needs to know you've chosen to keep people at arm's length. Whereas others of you, perhaps, you've tried to get in. You know, you hear this and you say, boy, I want that family. And so you lean into relationships in the church and, and people shoulder you out or, or you get hurt, you get burned a couple times and then you find yourself standing at a distance. The reality is there's problems on both sides of that equation and we're inclined to give up very quickly. But I want to just plead with you this morning to lean into the family of God 
as someone who has experienced tastes of what it's intended to be, as someone who's experienced the love from this family in unique and wonderful, special ways, I can tell you there's nothing like it. And there are many of you in this room who in your heart are, are nodding along. There's nothing like it. To be clear, I love my extended family. I love my brothers and my uncles and my aunts and my cousins. I do. I'm called to love them and honor them. But there are people in this room who know me far better than any of them ever will. We are bound together, not by, not by the blood that runs through our veins, but we are bound together by, by His blood. Right? Christ binds this family together, and that relationship is one that goes on into eternity. Not only do we need to understand this if we're going to see in this passage what we're meant to see, but I would argue, and I would argue this with urgency, that we need to live this out if we want to be used by the Lord in evangelism. If we want to see people coming to Christ here in this city, if we want to be used by the Lord here in this congregation, we must get this right. If you had your Bible open to Mark chapter 3, I want to invite you to flip ahead to Mark chapter 10 in verses 29 to 30, where Jesus makes this promise to His disciples. His disciples have, have left everything behind to follow Jesus, and, and they're concerned about what the future holds for them. And Jesus says to these concerned disciples, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution. So Jesus says there's going to be challenges in this life and in the age to come eternal life. And if you've attended here for any length of time, you've heard me say this before, but I will say it again and again and again because it matters. Jesus is making a promise here to the lost. The lost who would come to Him. The lost who would come to Him at great cost to themselves. He makes a promise. He, he tells them that they're going to have eternal life. And He's going to keep that promise. He tells them it's going to be hard. and We've all seen that that promise is true. But he also tells them that they're going to receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and lands. The question becomes, where are these houses and brothers and sisters and mothers? The answer is, they're right here. Right here in our midst. We have the houses. We are the brothers and the sisters and the mothers. And so Jesus is making a promise to the lost and He's writing our names on the check. He's promising them us. And He's not a liar. And He keeps His promises. Which means that we need to take this very seriously. He's saying to the lost, I know that you lost your job, your family and your circle of friends when you chose to follow Me. When I opened your eyes and you let go of everything and come, I know that there were things that you left behind, but I promise you that the church will be for you everything that you left behind and more. They'll invite you into their homes. They'll break bread with you. They'll be more than friends to you. They will be family. They will be the ones that you call when you're in crisis. They will be the ones that show you a love that you've never experienced before. I Promise, truly I say unto you, Jesus says. We must get this right. Because our gospel witness is at stake. And you ask maybe, what does that look like? And so here I just want to throw out an idea. And I pitched this three weeks ago. I said, I've got an idea. Talk to me afterwards if you'd like to hear it. Two of you came and thank you. That's wonderful. For the rest of you, now I'm just going to say it from the pulpit. What would it look like if... If you looked at your week and you found a night that was open and you said from here on out, let's say Wednesday night, our house will always be open on Wednesday night. We're going to spread the word in the church. We're going to tell our neighbors Wednesday night from 5 p.m. onwards, you can come to our house. We're going to put on a big pot of chili or a big thing of soup, nothing difficult, but you can come into our home and we'll have fellowship. What would it look like if 10 of us did that? And we got to a point where in this church family, Every single night of the week, there's a house that is open for people who want to be in relationship with the church. Think about, think about a, someone coming to Christ, a young woman. She's got three children with three different fathers. And it's been a rough life. And her, her family's not really involved. So she's been doing this on her own for as long as she can remember. 
And she hears the gospel, and she hears what Christ has done for her, and she is saved, and there's a transformation. She's at the church. She's weeping that Sunday. After the service, imagine if after the service someone comes to her and says, hey, I want you to know our house is open tonight, and we would love to have you. Here's the address. Five o'clock, you can come. Every Sunday night, it's open. Come. Imagine she comes, and she meets four new families And as she meets those families, they tell her, hey, you know, on Monday night, we're all going to be at this house, and and you're welcome to come. And on Tuesday night, if you're free, there's also a house over here. And suddenly this young mom who's been doing life on her own realizes that she has a home that is open to her, people who want her, a meal that's been prepared for her every night of the week if she needs it. Think about what a game changer that would be, that she realizes as she's come to Christ, that she now has a hundredfold all that she has lost and all that she longs for. Now, in this time, like what Jesus promised. Think about how easy it would be for us to make some adjustments in our lives where we could do that. So easy, so simple, so practical. What often happens instead is that not out of malice, not out of sin, perhaps out of carelessness, we all enroll our families in everything that we can think of and we're running in seven different directions every night of the week. And, and, you know, we come to church as often as we can, and we get there maybe two times a month, and, and this young woman slips in and slips out week after week, and perhaps she gets a high, and somebody asks her her name a couple times. And, but after six weeks of this hour and a half of seeing people she doesn't know and slipping back out into oblivion, she leaves the church altogether because it didn't have anything to offer her that was any different than what she would receive at a a club down the street. That that happens all the time, brothers and sisters. And again, I don't think it's because we're malicious. I think it's because we're a bit careless. I think it's because this culture has imposed some ideals upon us. I'll just throw this out to you. I would invite you to go home and to look at your calendar. Look at your calendar and ask the question, as my life is scheduled now, could I make a disciple? Right? Jesus calls us to go and make disciples. I want you to look at the calendar. Think about the fact that a disciple is someone that you teach in the ways of the Lord, someone that you do life with. Look at your calendar. Is there room for a single person to be discipled in my life? Perhaps look at your calendar and ask the question, is there even room for me to disciple my children in this calendar? I've lived in Canada for my entire life, and I recognize if you've been here for any length of time, you know this is a bit of a a hobby horse for me. I'm passionate about this, but it's because it, it matters. Church, I just pray that we would take very seriously the reality that we are a family. We are a family. And the Apostle Paul, again, in our passage, assumes that we believe that and understand that. And so having considered that now, I want to lean into this text where where Paul really leans into the family matters now. How do we relate to each other now that we understand that we are a family? That's what he's going to walk through. Family matters in the household of God. These are very practical. Let's work through them. Four four principles for us. First of all, Paul wants Timothy and, and us by extension to understand that age matters. Age matters. Now it's interesting that he says this because if you were with us last week, you know In the end of chapter 4, Paul said to Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth. And it would be easy for us to read that text and then to riff on it and to say, well, you see, do you hear that? In the family of God, age is just a number. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of our age differences are just erased in Jesus' name. But but that's not what Paul was saying. And he goes on here and he explains that There is a difference between the young and the old. He says, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers. Older women as mothers. Younger women as sisters in all purity. So in these verses, Paul's teaching Timothy that that there is a difference between the older men and the younger men and the older women and the younger women. And you don't treat them the same. You give those older men the respect you would give your father and the younger men your brothers. And the older women, the respect you would give to your mother. And the younger women, the respect that you would give to your sister. Because there is a respect that should accompany age. That's biblical. Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs, the glory of young men is their strength. 
And we appreciate that as they tear down the chairs Sunday after Sunday. It's glorious. We're thankful for young men. But the splendor of old men is their gray hair. Those gray hairs are splendor because those gray hairs were earned. He has those gray hairs because he's lived through 65 years of providing for his family, serving his church, striving to live a life of obedience, growing in holiness. She has those gray hairs because she knows what it is to bury her loved ones and to observe the fruit or the lack thereof in the children that she's raised in the home. You can't find that kind of wisdom, the wisdom that comes with the splendor of gray hair, you can't find that kind of wisdom in a Google search. It's hard-earned over the long haul. Therefore, Paul says to young Timothy, you speak to them with respect. Timothy's ministry in Ephesus and the ministry we have here in our community at Redeemer should be marked by love and respect that gives honor to those who are our seniors. Now, how do we do that? What does that look like? Well, that's the next thing that Paul explains in this text. The next thing that he says is, to Timothy is age matters, and therefore, tone matters. He writes, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. The word translated here as rebuke is a word that has the idea of, of striking a man. So it's a, it's a metaphorical idea of don't strike them with your words, Timothy. And if you're not sure what it looks like to strike someone with your words, you just scroll through Twitter for five minutes and you will see what it looks like to strike people with your words. Paul says that's not the way we do it in the household of God. And Timothy, you are to be exemplary in this. Over the last two and a half years, to our shame, there have been many Timothys in the Christian community who have verbally struck their elders. It's not uncommon even in our circles to hear young, angry Christian men uh, speak dismissively and insultingly about people who are concerned with tone. Uh, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but particularly in our reformed circle of Christianity, the tone police is an insult that we, we throw at people. People who are too sensitive, too overly concerned with, with feelings. And yet Paul was concerned with tone. Paul is concerned with tone. And I want you to take a minute, because we, then we say, well, you know, but this, these are urgent matters. Think about the circumstances that Timothy was dealing with. Paul was sending Timothy into Ephesus, a church that had gone off the rails into heresy. They had been healthy, but their witness had been absolutely destroyed by the false teaching that had crept into the church. There was immorality. It was an absolute mess to the point where we're wondering, is this church going to come through this? Paul sends this young man, Timothy, and he says, you need to grab hold of the steering wheel. You need to get it back on track. You need to have some really difficult conversations, Timothy. You need to preach the word. And then he stops and says, and Timothy, you watch your tone. Which is fascinating. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Where we fall short in this area is we often give ourselves liberty. We say, with this particular issue, I can just give vent to all of my anger and rage. Jesus flipped tables, we say. Well, Jesus is Jesus. And uh, we're far too inclined to flip tables when we shouldn't be. And we need to take this very seriously. Encourage him, as you would a father. Commentator William Mounts notes, his, that's Timothy, his approach should not be one of domination, but one of encouragement, including respect and honor. And before I go any further, because I feel like I, I can't go any further, I have to confess that I have fallen short in this regard. There have been times when I have used my spiritual authority to wag my finger and to browbeat those who were my spiritual fathers. Because I saw error saw things that weren't right, and I thought I was doing the, Lord work, the Lord's work, so I spoke harshly, and I corrected firmly, and I gave a condescending rebuke when I should have given a respectful encouragement. And my intentions were in the right place, but my tone was not. And I felt just very convicted as I wrestled through this, and I understand why Paul would be writing these instructions to Timothy, because it's difficult. It's difficult when you're dealing with things that are serious, things that really matter. It's difficult to do the right thing the right way. 
in that breath, having said that, I would love to encourage those of you who would self-identify as spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers in the congregation. I'd encourage you to model humility for us and patience with us. As one commentator notes, just as it's difficult for an older person to respect the teaching and leadership of a younger man, so also it is difficult for a younger man to know how to instruct and correct the older people in the church. It's a complicated dance of love and respect in the household of God. See, Paul didn't give Timothy permission to stop having the hard talks. There were some hard things that needed to be said. There were some older men who needed to be corrected in the church. But Timothy needed to do the right thing the right way. And sometimes people, especially younger people, are going to do the right thing the wrong way. Because the household of God is made up of sinners. Sinners who have been saved by grace, absolutely, but sinners who are not yet transformed in every area of their life to the image of Jesus Christ. We're going to step on each other's toes. And if you're here today and no one's ever stepped on your toe, you just stick around for one more week, right? It's clumsy here, and it's painful here, but it's worth it because it's family. And in the family of God, tone matters. That's the second thing Paul says. The third is this. Paul reminds Timothy, thirdly, that gender matters in our relationships in the household of God. So I talked about how someone might read that passage in 1 Timothy 4.12, but let no one despise you for your youth. Someone might read that passage and assume that age no longer matters. Well, in the same way, someone might take the passage in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, and mistakenly think that gender no longer matters in the household of God. Galatians 3.28 says, There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And it would be easy to take that passage and then to jump out and say, well, look at that. You know, the church was the first organization that recognized that gender is just a social construct. That, that, that under the gospel of Jesus Christ, everything that would differentiate us between male and female is, is gone. But that's not what Paul is saying. In the context of Galatians 3, it's clear that he's talking about our salvation. Meaning that when we come before the Lord, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Greek, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, we're one in Christ. That's what he's saying. But he is not trying to erase the distinctions between men and women any more than he was trying to erase the distinctions between Jews and Gentiles, between our our ethnic identities. Before we go further, we've talked about this in the past. I think it was Canada Day when we addressed this in a full sermon. But we recognize that, that there have been times in church history and generations before us where we did believe that the gospel erased all of our ethnic differences. Right? There was a time when we imposed all of our particular preferences upon different cultures and nations. It's like to follow Christ means you need to dress the way that I dress and sing the songs that I sing and use the instruments that I like and follow my liturgy. We did that. History proves it. And it it was dangerous. It wasn't helpful because the gospel celebrates the diversity of cultures. And in Revelation, we see a, a glimpse of the throne where all of the nations, peoples, tribes, and tongues, and languages are worshiping together. So it's not our job to obliterate ethnicity. And when we've tried to do that in the past, it has been an absolute disaster. Some of you have seen that. The reality is that all of us in our ministry are going to be affected by that for our entire life. Things like what happened in the residential school system. This factored into much of that. It's complicated, but this was a piece of it. Us trying to erase culture and conform everyone into our image, one image. So that's dangerous with with ethnicity, and we see that now, but here's what I want to make sure that we see. In our particular culture, I don't think that's the challenge or the struggle we're going to face. That won't be our temptation. Our temptation will be to erase the differences between male and female. So we're we're going to move into a different battlefield. And from forces that push us from outside and forces that push us from within, we're going to try to erase every distinction between men and women. We're going to erase every distinction between the roles that we play in the home, the roles that we play in the church. We're going to try to erase every distinction between the strengths that we have and the weaknesses that we have as men and as women. And I would just encourage you, church, we cannot go that route. 
Because we lose the beauty of the glory of what God has made in the church and in us when we do that, when we try to erase our distinctiveness. God created them male and female. In his own image, he created them, male and female. If we lose male and female, we lose something of the image of God in us. We need both. And Paul says, no, you, you need to remember, young Timothy, that the men and the women are different. And you should relate with them differently. You speak to your father differently than you speak to your mother, don't you? You speak to your brother differently than you speak to your sister. And it's not a difference in quality. It's not a difference in respect. Those relationships are equal in terms of their importance, but they are different, Timothy. Gender's not a non-factor. It matters. But then how? How practically does gender matter in the church? How does this affect the way that we relate with one another? Well, that's the fourth thing that Paul explains in this passage. He says, gender matters, and flowing out of that, he says, and Timothy, purity matters. In the household of God, in these relationships, purity matters. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters in all purity. The word translated here as purity conveys a sense of sexual chastity. That means he's not to look at the younger women as if they're objects. He's not to entertain inappropriate thoughts in his mind. He's not to say or do things that would make them feel unsafe or uncomfortable. He should show a discretion and a wisdom in his ministry, in the choices that he makes, that would protect both his sisters in Christ and himself from any credible charge of purity. Because his sister in Christ is equal with his brother in Christ, but she is also different. And his relationship with her should respect that difference. And here I want to stop, and I want to just say with all clarity what Paul is not saying. Because it's possible, and it happens all the time, to go too far in applying this passage and to unintentionally communicate to young women that they are dangerous in some way, like a ticking time bomb or a contagious disease. It's possible to leave young women feeling like there's something to be feared and avoided by men, and that's not what Paul is saying. I've spoken to women who've been made to feel that way, and it often distorts their image of themselves, their image of, of their body, their image of sexuality, it does lasting damage. The, the damage that's done when we get this wrong often bleeds into marriages where women just aren't sure what to do. It's, just, it's, a, it's a mess. Psychologically, it does damage. Physically, it does damage. That, that idea of purity culture. So in our camp, there's also purity culture is another term that's thrown out in a derogatory way. Because when they talk about purity culture, they talk about a culture in the church where we treat women as if they are like these lust-inducing objects that need to be covered up and kept away from the men. And, and that culture is wrong. That's not what Paul's calling for here. When, when Paul calls for purity in the church, he's calling for wisdom. He's calling for prudence. And he's calling for the realism that respects the fact that men and women are different. And, and you need to handle that carefully, Timothy. You need to be mindful in the way that you minister and in the culture that exists within the church. He needs to be mindful of purity as he ministers to the young women in the household of God. For their sake, for his sake, and for the sake of the gospel witness in the city. And it, I know it feels awkward to touch on these things, but we must. This is what's next in the text. And this year alone, in this province alone, more scandals have broken out in the church in Ontario. And there are whole communities that are reeling because this wasn't taken seriously. Sinful men doing sinful things. We must get this right in the household of God. So how do we do that? Where do we even begin? Well, as we're coming to a close, I would suggest something novel here. I, I would suggest that we take seriously some of the prescriptions for us that we find in the Bible. Like the Bible speaks to these differences and it gives us direction. Here's a direction that I would just pray that we would take very seriously as a church. Titus chapter 2 in Titus chapter 2, Paul calls upon the women in the church of Crete. He calls upon the older women to take upon the mantle of, of raising up and mentoring and discipling the younger women. Is that because men are incapable of mentoring or discipling younger women? 
No. But it's because women are better equipped to understand the challenges that younger women face. They're better equipped to minister to them in a way that is pure and right and faithful. And Paul says that ought to happen. It should be happening in Crete. It should be happening here at Redeemer. And so young women, I would encourage you today, look around. If you don't have an older woman who's speaking intentionally into your life and and praying for you and helping you navigate through the challenges you face, you should look around the room and you should find someone. And older women, I would say even more so to you, if you don't have a younger woman that you're discipling and praying for and, and helping to walk through this life, you should look around the room and you should find someone. That is, that is one of the tools that God has given us to do this well, to equip all of the saints in the household of God in a way that is good and right and faithful. But for men, in the same way, I mean, we're studying a letter right now that was written by an older man to a younger man that he's discipling. We too need to be discipled. And so younger men, if you don't have a, a Paul in your life, somebody who's, who's mentoring you, who's praying for you, walking with you, then you should find one. And older men, if you don't have a Timothy in your life, then you should look around and you should find one. Let's cultivate that culture here as we walk together in the household of God. And as we conclude, I want to acknowledge that I beat this drum often. Um, if I have a hobby horse and I'm sure I do, then this is it. Family in the church, unity, our relationships, going beyond the the charade that is so prevalent in Canadian culture. I'm really passionate about this, and I'll put my cards on the table. Yes, it's true. You could talk about that in the car on the way home. But I will tell you, I'm convinced by the Word of God that this is enormously important. And I'm convinced by 32 years in Canada that this is an area where we consistently miss the mark. And so, and as a church, we must do better. We can do better. We have the Spirit. We can do this. We must do this. We're a family. And until we start to live more and more like who we are, we won't see new people coming to Christ here. And you say, well, that's a strong statement. Do you feel comfortable saying that? I do. Here's why. Because Jesus promised the lost that when they left it all behind to follow Him, He promised them that there would be a family on the other side. He promised that. And He's not a liar. And that suggests to me that if we decide that we're too busy, we're too private, we're too guarded, to be the church, to be the family of God, then Jesus will use someone else. He will have to use someone else. So for the glory of God and the spread of the gospel and the enjoyment and the fulfillment that it brings, brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, I want to invite you, you who are already laboring in this, and I see it, I want to invite you to strive for the sake of the gospel and His spread in this city Strive to be the family of God, the household of God here at Redeemer. And to that end, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to be together today. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to sit under the preaching of your word. Lord, I pray that you'd press your truth into our hearts. Lord, and I, once again, I would just say, Lord, anything that, that does not belong, anything that is just... Uh, coming over from, from my passions, from, from things that, I'm, uh, that I wanted to include. Lord, let it fall to the floor, but let your word go forth with authority. And Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, Lord, we long to see more and more men and women come to know you. We who have received the grace of God in Jesus Christ, who have, have experienced as all of our sin has been washed away by the blood of Christ. We who have been brought now into the family of God and have brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, Lord, we want that for everyone in this city. Every single person, God, I would ask for that. Every man, every woman, every boy and every girl. God, would you save them? And would you see fit to use us, Lord, to be disciple makers, to go forth with this glorious news? And Lord, I just I pray that you would help us increasingly day by day to to be faithful on our end. Lord, that people wouldn't come in and be disillusioned by the loneliness, but Lord, that they would come in and be overwhelmed by 
by the promise that has been kept, by the family that is there for them on the other side. Uh, Lord, we, we just want to do that more and more. Lord, we confess that we fall short. We confess that we can't do it in our own strength. And Lord, we ask for your help. So Lord, would you cultivate that here? Lord, I pray that you'd guard our witness. I pray that you'd guard our young men and women from speaking with disrespect to those who are our mothers and fathers in the faith. Lord, I, that, that requires a heart change. Lord, not that we would just guard our tongues, but that we would see our mothers and fathers in the faith with new eyes. Lord, I pray that you'd give patience to those who are older. Lord, patience as they bear with those who are younger and encourage them slowly and steadily. Lord, I pray that you'd guard our purity. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would just guard us, that we would be wise, that we'd be prudent. Lord, that we would be able to celebrate and enjoy the diversity of the men and women that are in this congregation. But Lord, that we would never be so flippant as to put any of our younger women in a, in a place where they're in danger. Uh, Lord, so we just ask for that. Lord, would you give us great wisdom? Lord, would you guard our witness, we pray. And Lord, I pray for healing in Ontario. For, I think of some of the stories that have come out even this year. And Lord, I pray for healing for those who have been hurt, those who have felt betrayed, uh, those church families that, that feel disillusioned. Lord, I just pray that you would minister peace in a way that only you can. Oh God, so we ask for this in faith. And Lord, help us now. Help us as we respond in song. Help us as we come to your table. And Lord, help us as we go out into the world to be salt and light for you and for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Worship team, would you lead us?